adult. And when my therapist was talking about this, it was particularly, it, it spoke to me particularly strongly. And it's something that's often come back to me over the years as kind of a description of the sensitive part inside of ourselves. And I think what Slaughter Dick is working on in this chapter is another way of looking at this sensitive membrane that we carry around or the sensitive ball that we carry, carry around inside of ourselves. I do so. I, I um, so it's a kind of a hymn to the sirens. Um, I did enjoy the chapter a great deal. Um, I try to look at it with Ed's rather critical sense, but I don't always ex- succeed. So uh, we'll see how I do with that. Um, so it's about entering. Um, so it, it it's about entering the soundscape of our own yearnings that's the way i see the the chapter and if you were if you could actually enter the soundscape of your own yearning why would you ever want to leave and i think that's part of what he's uh, describing um it for me the story of the sirens and the soundscape and and this idea of of entering into the sensitive, the sensitive part of the person echoes the Calypso story in Odyssey. So there's a kind of a parallel between the sirens and the Calypso episode where uh, Odysseus spends a year with, uh, or, or several years with Calypso. Um, I'm wondering also whether or not um, Slaughter Dick isn't um, a little bit like in the uh, uh, the previous chapter, and they had this whole thing about being maybe the hidden artist in the background of the Magritte painting, where he was sort of part of, the, where the artist is part of the landscape, and we were speculating whether or not Slardik was maybe conjoined with the artist who was hidden. Here, I think Slardik may be warning us that, in a sense, he is constructing a siren song for us. And uh, so there's a kind, you know, he has this kind of humor in his work where he plays with these kinds of ideas. Um, it's the binds. So he makes this idea that it's the binds that are within us that stop us from giving into the own, our own siren song. So this is the, so the binds of, of, uh, Odysseus at the mast, but also our relational binds, our emotional binds that stop us from giving in to the siren song. Um, so through, so this is quote through, so I read an English version for this. Through its advanced hearing of the ego motive, the individual forms a pact with its own future from which it draws the joy of living towards fulfillment. So that was this kind of, um, I do think this future oriented uh, uh, um, connection with our destiny is is also an interesting aspect of this uh, discussion. Um, Slaughter Dick draws a link between the sirens and this idea of sirens in, in war. So war sirens, air raid sirens, and industry sirens. Um, and I think that's a link to some of his other writings because I know that there are other, that he's written about that subject in, in other work. Um, he makes a relationship to, um, well, obviously the whole thing is about mothers in relation to the unborn children. Um, but, uh, I was interested in, like, he, he makes these statements about, uh, uh, mothers being uh, devoted to their children, to their unborn children and, and these sort of, uh, engagements with the unborn children. And I was interested. So I did some background research on this and it, it is indeed borne out by recent research in the last two decades or so, um, that there is this kind of emotional engagement of the mother towards children, uh, unborn children. Um, He also posits a pre-birth experience um, of a reception of maternal devotion. So this idea of um, 
that we receive the devotion of the mother through the placenta is the way I understood that. Um, but, and it's kind of like, uh, uh, it's similar to an Oedipal argument. It's this idea that uh, we cherish being praised uh, by somebody, by the mother, and that, that, that having had this experience with the mother, we then seek praise from others. Um, it's, I haven't talked about the sound aspects, but it's all this immersive sound elements. Um, and as somebody who's worked, I've worked for the last uh, 15 years with um, singers and uh, the sort of whole, so one of the things that we've discussed with the singers is this idea that as human beings, we live inside what what we call auric space. So this sort of immersive sound space that is has a much deeper connection to the person than we normally give it credit for. And so I think, again, this resonates, if you'll pardon the word, with what Slotstick is saying. Um, so if the mother is less welcoming, Sloterdijk doesn't talk about this a lot, but one can infer that if the mother is less welcoming than the standard mother, then that could cause difficulties with the devotion, with the connection. And, and I think that comes back to this idea of the membrane that I was talking at the beginning about the sensitive uh, membrane. Uh, humans are sphere dwellers from the start, he says. Um, acoustics is all about circles because the sound propagates out from a source in a circle and so I think this may be part of why he's the link between spheres and perception and human experience is, is the sound spaces are about spheres in, in a sense so um, uh, John I know at I think at an earlier point you you talked about some of his interesting words, and, and he ends on this idea of sonospheric communards, which I thought was a very <laughs> clever <laughs> word. In terms of the consumerism, so he goes on in the in the excursus about um, this idea of consuming, uh, which so another kind of soul food. Um, but the, and this consuming is normally a metaphor, but he's saying it's more than a metaphor. It's actually built into the way that uh, that we experience the mother as a kind of as embryos or as fetuses. We consume the mother, and so there's this idea of absorption or cons uh, consuming. Um, and he finishes that section on something that I thought was very interesting as he talks about two kinds of, I can't remember exactly, but it's about representation versus two times two types of truth, representational truth versus absorption truth. Um, and, and although it sounds very odd, I actually think there's something interesting uh, and useful there. Um, uh, as Because one of the things that I've been working on with colleagues is this whole idea of a non-representational view of cognition. So this idea that cognition is all about represent, mental representations. And there's a growing group of people who challenge that idea. But Slaughterdick is sort of saying, well, the, op the if it's not representational, then it's absorptional. Uh, so I'm wondering if that's the only other possibility. He, at the very end, he he has a sentence where he, puts absorption with um, imminence. And so there's this connection between imminence and uh, absorption, which is interesting. So I have some questions about that. I thought it was very interesting. The Lacan thing, I know nothing about Lacan. I have never read Lacan. So I had no way of sort of relating to what he was saying. It seems to be an argument against imaging or, or an argument for sound immersion in opposition to imaging for this mirror argument that he has but i have no under no no possibility of understanding that so i'd like help with that if anybody can offer some mm -hmm. 
That's it. Okay. I hope that was useful. Well, <laughs> Very, thank you. Nice That's always useful. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, before we started recording, I made a few comments about how I didn't think I would have that much to say on this topic because I've been traveling. I've been uh, kind of busy around around traveling. I've been in a conference the last couple of days. And so I don't feel like I really uh, grokked uh, the chapter. But there's so much to say uh, about it uh, because as soon as we get into the realm of music, it's an entire universe uh, of possibilities. Uh, if we really want to talk about styles of music, what music is actually doing. Um, and I'll share an anecdote about that as well that I think will be a little bit more precise. Uh, but what I found most interesting about this chapter uh, and the argument that I think Sloterdijk is making here is that rather than take music taking us outside of ourselves, he's saying that it brings us back to some sense of some feeling sense of who we are, that we want to be with, that we are in the course of mental and imagistic life removed from, maybe not alien, but removed from. And that when we hear music, we are brought back to this intimate, uh, absolute, kind of sonosphere. The more we get lost in it, the more, in a sense, we feel like ourselves. And I'm, I'm reminded of uh, uh, the John Lennon uh, and uh, the, the messages that he, that, that he would get that it seems like you're, t you're saying what I wanted to say. You're talking for me. Or, you're, or the, the way that people feel that a musician or the music uh, is them. They, they actually... They, I, it feels like you. It's hard to say exactly what that means. I and mean, that's part of the issue here. But when you hear a song or when you hear a piece of music that speaks to you, so course speaks to you, in some sense, it's letting you, it's giving you a shape of what you already feel. And when you resonate with that shape, you're feeling that sense of self-completion uh, that gives you a, a particular form. Uh, and I thought I found it interesting as well that uh, that 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 desire to be devoted, lauded that he talks about, uh, the desire to be sung, if you will, to 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 exist as song, as the sort of goal that one might have, the sort of telos that one might have that we we can never quite reach except in those moments of transport, uh, that, that that may be really sort of the pulling us uh, towards, you know, through our, our various complications and through, you know, our other modes of engagement, verbal, imagistic, uh, work-related, etc. He talks about work as well. It was a very interesting kind of theory of what we're looking for in work or how that takes us away from what we actually want. Uh, and, and the dangers in that, because the siren, of course, is what needs to be resisted uh, in, order to, in order to actually make it home. Uh, the way in which music can be a false, uh, a substitute uh, for the real thing. And uh, how dangerous that could be when we are in a religious or a spiritual context. And when we are not just the consumers, but the, the consumed. Uh, when we go from uh, the table where we eat and commune as free you know, agents uh, to that where we sacrifice ourselves to the divinity uh, and how dangerous it can be to sacrifice yourself to the wrong divinity. So I found these, these points interesting. The anecdote I wanted to share was that uh, when, uh, when we had our first child, my wife and I, when we had our first child, she was born prematurely by about nine weeks. Uh, 10 weeks. And at the time, I was, uh, you know, of course, very concerned about what, what she would be missing by not being in the womb during this 
last phase of her intrauterine development. And one of the things I, I read about was the role of sound and, and music in, in helping the fetus, uh, the developing child, feel safe, feel loved. Uh, because when you have the premature baby outside of the womb, they're in an incubator. So they're in a sterile environment. They're separated from the mother. And so what I did is, and, and, and in an intense, a NICU, a neonatal intensive care unit, what I did is I created a, a mix of music, uh, uh, like eight hour, like a 10 hour mix. I put it on the iPod shuffle or whatever. Uh, and whenever we weren't there and whenever we weren't in the space with her and doing uh, what they call kangaroo care, which is when you hold the baby next to your breast uh, and just, you know, share that, um, I'd have the music playing and I asked permission from the nurses to have it play all night and I kind of arranged it so they could, they could play it when, when we left. And that was it. I still have the mix somewhere, but I chose a number of songs and pieces that I thought would be supportive of the child uh, during the time that we were away. So I put a great weight on this, on this theory uh, of, of the sonosphere being essential for our well being and for our development. And um, I, I, I thought that again, like the way that Sloterdijk is, is, peeling away the, the intimate layers of the onion to show what are the phases or what are the spaces that are really prior to the mental, prior to the image, prior to the verbal, uh, and how, how important those are uh, in, our, in all the subsequent sort of layers that accue, accrue uh, on top of it, uh, I think is poignant. And so... Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Appreciate your introduction, Jeffrey. Okay, can I can I chime in? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very unprepared for this. Uh, it brought up a lot of different stuff. Okay, all right, everybody, oh, oh. listen. up. No, no, second, John. You're the next person who said, "Well, I really didn't read this." Now, okay, the other people have to fess up too. Did you guys read it? Oh, no, no, I read it. I read yeah. it. Yeah, and I did read it. I did read it. I just, I just didn't immerse myself in it the way that. Okay. It didn't sonically resonate with you. <laughs> it sounded to me. Oh, oh, I, I didn't know you were here. Hi, Wendy. Um, okay. John, I I read it, yeah. and I okay. read it again actually. I'm just pulling it. Yeah. And um, it just brings up a lot of. It's very confusing. I think he's. I I believe he's. Uh, trying to focus on what identity is, what, um, what the person is, and when this begins. Um, and it's very difficult because we're looking at so much that's pre-verbal. So he's talking about this soundscape that the neonate is tuning into and developing around. Um, and he also talked about tomatas who's a great innovator in working with the inner ear and disturbances in the inner ear. And um, I just want to quote him. He says, the ear decides within certain boundaries how welcome or unwelcome the various acoustic stimuli are. That's on page 506, I believe. He goes on to say, in listening carefully, the ears carry out the primal act of the self. All later instances, I can, I want, I come, by necessity follow on from this first manifestation of spontaneous liveliness. So he's talking about the ear, and I'm curious about what is the, what is the relationship between the ear and the embryo, which he doesn't quite get explicit about. Um, but he does say that the ear can decide, or the ear can shut out certain sounds, and it can receive other sounds. So there's already an element of choice that the ear makes. And I'm once again curious about the whole, uh, the whole system. Um, I, I know the, from the research I've done, I think I get this from Tomatis, that the first system that really kicks in is the um, vestibular system, which is that inner ear, which, which differentiates up, down, left, right. It orients us in space. And it seems like every other process follows from that orientation in space. 
So this brings up a whole lot of uh, questions. And I think the questions that he raises are interesting. I don't think he's come to any um, satisfying conclusion. Um, and I don't know that any of us have or any of us ever will. <laughs> I actually think this is a, something that we're, we're all drawn to and attracted to, this, uh, this sense of where we come from and where we're going. Um, but I think it's very difficult. Uh, I think he doesn't mention Spencer Brown and the laws of form, but I think it's relevant here because Spencer Brown um, talks about distinction, making a distinction. Once a distinction is made, there's an inside and there's an outside. And once you go from the inside to the outside, there's a, how do you re-enter that indicated space? Once that's where the self-reflective capacity we, we have, if we're lucky, uh, starts to occur is when we, in, when we re-enter uh, an indicated space. So I think Spencer Brown's talking about, he's talking more about logic, but I think this is also very experiential. Um, throughout life, we're constantly making distinctions that then create insides and outsides. And then we have to sort of negotiate as we, um, as we pass back over uh, in a space that we've indicated or someone else has indicated for us. So um, I'm just reminded of this, um, for strangely enough, this uh, Gertrude Stein told a story about a father and a son. And uh, there was a fight. And the father, the father was being dragged by the son. The son was dragging the father out into the woods because the son was going to beat him up. And the father said, stop right there. And the son said, what do you mean, stop right here? I'm going to beat the shit out of you, old man. The old man, the father said, stop right here. Because when I beat up my father, that, this is where we stopped. And I'm just... I think these uh, sort of, Gertrude Stein, of course, is very famous for her, uh, her strange sort of elusive um, language. But I think this is a very con concrete story. And actually, uh, this came out of her book uh, about making of Americans. Maybe it's a very American kind of story. Um, at any rate, I'm just throwing this out here because I think it's very um, perplexing, um, these kinds of... Um, inside, outside, and negotiations between the inside and outside, and the self-reflexive, which is not the same thing as self-reflecting. When, when I think Lacan gets into the mirror as something that reflects the sense of self to the child, this is very different, I think, um, because it requires movement. There's a movement from the inside to the outside. So it's, it's, it's kinesthetic and auditory, not just visual sort of stationary out there over there in the in the in the mirror which is still and and is receiving this image of me over here um so anyway just throwing that out there uh there are lots of more things i could say i've taken some notes but it's um a bit of a jumble like i said um, i hope that's relevant to this discussion i don't know where exactly to go with this <laughs> Everybody's being sonically quiet. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you something else that happened. I had a had a dream last night after I read this chapter. Unless some, unless Ed. No, no, Ed, no, go, go right ahead, John. I'd rather hear your dream. I, I love this, I love the silence. I can really, I really. Can yeah, into, but I'd love to hear your dream. Well, this is, I'm reluctant to talk about dreams because other people's dreams sometimes can be very boring, but I think this might be relevant. Oh, I always find yours exciting. I read, this, <laughs> I read this text right before bed, mm -hmm. and um, I woke up in the middle of the night, I did a little meditation, and I went back, and I was thinking about this, how to differentiate uh, the inside and the outside and what happens, and um, in the inner ear, I've had inner ear problems. I had a about I had about a vertigo for the first time in my life about a year ago. So there was about a three month period where everything was spinning around whenever I sat up too quickly or, or if I lay down too quickly. 
the room might, everything started to spin. So it's very much a, oh, this is very interesting experience for me. Um, but I've also had these strange sort of psychic experiences in there, uh, and what I would call out-of-body experiences. Um, but they always started, which is different from a lucid dream. Out-of-body experiences, for me, started with the inner ear, a, a cacophonous buzzing. And the whole, felt like the whole, it felt like a, an engine was inside of your head. Uh, it softened and it mellowed and it became less uh, strident. But that's where it all began. So I, I, I think there is a relationship between the inner ear and those high frequencies and those low frequencies mm -hmm. and altered states of consciousness. Um, but anyway, in this, this particular episode last night, I had, um, it was like a, I was in bed, in bed. I heard noises out in the hallway. I was sort of in a semi-lucid state. Um, it wasn't, a, it didn't feel like I was out of body or anything, but I went to the door and I thought, well, I shouldn't open it. I, I want to be sure the door is locked, but I mistakenly opened it up and then closed it. So I alerted whoever was out in the hall making these disturbing noises that my door was open because I had no lock and I couldn't lock it. So I, so I made a decision. Well, I can't lock the door. I don't know what this intruder is, what this noise is all about, but I'm going out there and I'm gonna confront it. So I opened the door, I went out into the hallway and I saw these uh, two black men, contemporary, um, and they were wrestling, they were fighting. And as I watched them fight, they also started to morph. They became very fluid and very liquid and started to morph into one another. And so I went, I went back into my apartment and I went back into the bed and I lay down and then I realized I was in my physical body in my physical bed and my eyes were open and I could still see the two men fighting or morphing it, it actually it morphed in sort of a, a dance like uh, configuration and the threat and the threat was gone but what's, what was curious to me is that my physical eyes are wide open and I see this image floating about a foot away from me. And I'm just curious about this whole notion of inside and outside and inner world and outer world and this interface between. Um, because when does an, a dream image, something generated from your interior, but if you open your eyes and you see it in front of you, it's in a physical location now. It's something very curious, there's something very curious about that status of that image because now that image is, is an hallucination and hallucinations are true and they're false in our physical world the person who has hallucinations has something wrong with them so i'm just looking at the status of these kinds of experiences and how we can as we move in and out and we mark uh, an indication an indicated space as we um i don't think we're at the even at the very beginning of understanding any of these kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. And I read Freud and I've, I don't know much about Lacan, but the little bit I know doesn't impress me very much. Um, and I think um, I just have big, more and more questions and more and more meta questions about my own experiences and the experiences that others have reported to me and about our um, latent potentials, perhaps. Um, I do think Gebser, our study of Gebser was very supportive because I think he understood the, the, the possibilities of the integration of the, the, the archaic, the magical, the mythical, the, the rational. Mm -hmm. and I think Ed mentioned in one of our posts online, I think he said very eloquently that it's not just the efficient rational that has to start operating, um, but we also need efficient expressions of the magical and the mythical as well, mm -hmm. which was a corrective to the way I was thinking. Because my, my main desire here, I want to liberate the subtle realms. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's why we're really, really fucked up right now, uh, socially and uh, politically. Uh, I think uh, a lot of our trouble originates, I think, in these, um, these what he's calling pre-subjective spaces. But I don't know what a pre-subjective space could possibly be. I had a friend who had an amnio. I don't know what, what you call those amnios where they stick a needle into the embryonic and to to check mm -hmm. out the uh, yeah. whether the baby will be a viable. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I know my friend, when she had this process done, she saw the, the, uh, the, the embryo, which later became her son. She saw the embryo spontaneously move away from the needle. Mm -hmm. So that seems to me that there's already a sense of agency, a sense of inside, outside, a sense of appropriate and inappropriate at a very, in, in, the, in the embryo. So anyways, I'm just throwing that out, not to clarify anything, but maybe make things a little more. Um, I think at the edge of complexity, there's a lot of vi um, vibrant um, energy. And I think these subtle experiences that people have as adults, I think those subtle experiences are hugely amplified in the womb. Um, and I think, um, I think there is a, I think a, a blessing, a very bl a great blessing about being an embodied human being. Mm -hmm. This is so much nicer <laughs> arrangement than I think other, uh, um, my experience of uh, subtle realms can be mm -hmm. extremely magnificent and also extremely horrific. I think the extremes uh, in our affects, the spectrum of our transphysical senses are infinitely more, infinitely more variety than what we can register in our, uh, our, our physical apparatus, or at least mine so far. As beautiful, as wonderful, and as terrible some of the experiences I've had, nothing of it quite compares to what I've had in what I would call the extra physical, or the, some of the people call out of body. But anyway, those are my interests um, and um, my, my confusion I'm sharing with you. I'm just putting it all out there on the table. I, I haven't come up with any adequate theories um, that fit my experience or the experiences of many people that I know. Those anomalies, those really weird things, um, those synchronistic events, telepathic experiences. I just think our deficient mental science is just not up to speed. And at least I think we're getting to the point where we don't burn people at the stake for having these alternate kinds of knowings. Um, but I think that we have to find a way of, of uh, I'm, I'm all for a, a, you know, looking at the qualitative science, how we can move out of, I think the healthy rational science would be much more qualitative than this. I think there are signs of this happening already, um, rather than this rigid quantification scheme. And if it can't be weighed or if it can't be numbered or it can't be um, quantified, it does not exist. I think that's incredibly insane and ex extremely, you know, that's almost like the norm. So many people think this way. Anyway, that's my rant. <laughs> thank you for thank you for listening. Uh, I'd like to pick up on something you said, John. Well, two things actually. One of them was how the inner ear helps us orient ourselves in space. I agree, hundred percent. You have middle ear problems. You're lost. But the thing about sound itself, sound is one of those. We hear it because of the vibrations, the frequencies. We, we, we perceive different frequencies. We can make tonal distinctions if we're not tone deaf. And, and so my, my question is, even though this, provide, this provides a basic orientation in space on the one hand, but isn't sound itself that which, um, well, I only got the German word right now. The only thing it it like it negates the space. You you really can't. It doesn't separate you. The thing about music is it draws you in, or the thing about anything sonoric, it draws you in. And now we may have to be careful about how far we're drawn and whether or not we lose some kind of control that we think that we might have or whatnot. But is it isn't it sound that eliminates? the distinctions other than the tonality itself rather do you see where i'm trying to go with this i, I don't know if there's a, a spatial separation at that point because it is about picking up on these frequencies that we that we hear and that's why i also i believe very much so um i have a grandson right up here in the front room who loves german hit music he never listened to it when he was in the womb that's not what my daughter listens to 
but he loves this and he's also very musical, but she did listen to a lot of music and we have a lot of music in our house. So I can see where, where, where these effects are very real. And I, and I think that they also need to be pursued, but I don't, I don't get the distinction part because of that always drawing us in because we, and Jeffrey used the word very often. And I think it was the appropriate word to use. We resonate. We resonate with these ideas. We resonate with the what we think he's saying or what what he is saying. Perhaps uh, you know. There's all of this, you know, bringing together the the, the point that Marco made. I, I understand. I'm not much of a musician. Played clarinet when I was a kid, but I understand what it means to be the music, or or, or that's that's me. Is that that's where I can actually become myself. Um, and and it is non-visual, and it is, um, uh, it, but it's completely vibrational. You know, so sound relies on the vibrations, and we pick those up whether or not we hear it or not. That's why deaf people will respond to um, to music also in in a di- way different than we do, of course. But there's that connection, so it seems to be something more connecting. And this is the first time I've seen Sloterdijk actually say something meaningful about connection where he goes, and, and don't fall for it, because you have to resist the song and so I, That's a little hyperbolic, I know, but where would we be without it? It's pure ed. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, um, let me just chime in, because this was one of those chapters for that for the first time. I was actually channeling my inner ed. <laughs> um, because... I, the first, because when he starts off with the whole sirens thing, and I, and I, I love the imagery. I love the story. I love, I, I know, the, you know, the, the Greek mythology of it all. For, but for the first, I don't know, 10 pages or so, I'm trying to figure out, okay, how does this pick up where we just left off with this wow. idea of the mother and the placenta and that whole thing. And then when I finally got to the section about the interuterine sonic malayu and being able to hear certain tones and frequencies from the mother's voice, I'm like, damn it, why didn't you flip those around? That would have made this chapter made more sense if you had explained, you know, okay, you got the baby, you got the fetus, it's on its way out, but before it's on its way out, it has this sonic experience and what happens then when it comes out and it's, you know, now it's, the sounds are harsher, you know, depending on, like you said, Marco, the environment in which the baby is born. You know, if it's a controlled environment, it may be a very gentle, soothing experience. If it's in a very loud hospital with lots of beeping and people around, it's going to be very, jarring you know so that was my first problem with all this is i'm like god i'm like i feel like i'm dead i just want to scream at this guy. It makes no sense. and then you know and then i took the wendy approach to it i'm like okay the wendy approach to it then is well i am i do consider myself musical i've i sing in a chorus i've played instruments since i was four i can read music i love music i have had those not quite out of body experience, but out of mind experiences where I've been listening to music either through my headsets or in a very um, in a dark club, you know, some music and some adult scents going around. And you can let yourself go and let yourself experience that. And I love that. But now if you if you think about that in terms of what Slaughter Dyke is saying, I'm looking at it in two different lenses. When I feel myself getting immersed in that music and being pulled away. Is it because it's echoing the sounds I heard when I was in my mom based on the music that she listened to, which by the way, my mom and I don't have any of the similar taste of music. Is it making up for a lack of something that I should have heard in the womb? Like I was expecting this frequency. I was expecting a certain tone. I was expecting a certain vibration. I can get it. So now when I'm hearing it externally, I, my body's resonating for it saying, yes, I'm receptive to this. This is what I want. Or is it, is it the siren song that, yes, I'm, gosh, I'm really attracted to this music. I don't know why I really, really love it, but, you know, shit, is this going to be the end of my demise? Like, like somehow suddenly this music is singing a praise and feeding into my ego and, you know, singing my completion song. And, you know, that has some eerie implications because what if the song that you're drawn to has these really either sad overtones or violent overtones or, absurdist overtones like if it's atonal music or if it's you know uh you know the lyrics just are violent or or they don't make any sense you know i've had those experiences where i know i don't know i 
music in foreign languages that I don't understand the language, but I understand I love the music and I'm drawn to it. What if I find out that the song is about killing your mother? I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm trying to figure out in that modern sense, what does it mean to be drawn to certain types of music? What does that say about you? Is it making up for something or is that leading you towards a deceptive or deficient version of yourself? Discuss. Well, <laughs> I love that, Wendy. I think Schlatterdijk said that ideally we're born into chamber music. I think that's very Eurocentric. I'm sure most human beings were born and they lived and they prospered and they died and they never listened, never heard chamber music. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they probably heard, you know, some sort of percussive sounds initially before anything like chamber music. So I think that's a very Eurocentric, uh, high German culture fascination, um, which is not universal. Uh, and I remember Adorno, this is not fair to Schlatterdijk, but I know Adorno who was a great music theorist, right? Mm -hmm. He called American jazz lumpen proletariat music. Yeah. <laughs> Coltrane was a lumpen proletariat as far as I know. <laughs> I think it, 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 I, th I love chamber music and I would agree, I'd rather go out or come in with chamber music than I would with anything heavy metal. But you know what? You know, these jazz artists, um, they were, they're not lump and proletariat. No, so no. I'm just throwing that out there that we have our, our, our own musical taste. And I, I think he's just like every other human. He projects his own favorite style. I think he talked about the Berlin Love Parade and mm -hmm. uh, it sort of sounded like it was a real schmaltzy kind of event as far as he was concerned. And, and, and he no. seems to sort of denigrate pop music. Mm -hmm. uh, seems to. Yeah, I think he does. <laughs> I think he outright blatantly Rejects. Yeah, and, I, <laughs> I, and as I've gotten older, I dis mm -hmm. I, I came from the South, so I hated a lot of music because I didn't like the South. I didn't like my experiences there, and I wanted to get out. So I was listening to Beethoven and Bach very early, and no one, and everyone thought it was crazy. But now I can look back and I listen to Tammy Wynette, mm -hmm. and I can listen to country western, and I'm totally charmed by it, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of pop music. Um, you know, it has a rhythm and a beat, and I can join other people in that rhythm and beat, and it, it can become quite intoxicating. Mm -hmm. Of course, sometimes there are intoxicants around when people are listening to this music, so there is a kind of a... Anyway, I don't denigrate all that. You know, I think that every music has a... can, can um, invite a high cognitive development. A lot of Mozart and Bach probably do, and there's a lot of music that's, you know, First and second shock, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and uh, I think they're all valid. Mm -hmm. And then there's music that's very intimate, and then there's a march that's very public. Anyway, that's what I was responding to when as you were talking, because mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I think of myself, I don't play a musical instrument. My brother did, he was a pianist, but I never did. But I uh, was always drawn to music very early age. But I was gay, so it was mm -hmm. like, if you were, you were really targeted. I think all sensitive boys are, um, mm -hmm. but if you're working class um, and you're, you're, you're sensitive at all, you like poetry, you like music, you better keep it a secret <laughs> 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 until later on it's more appropriate for you or you found a, a setting that supports that. Times may have changed a great deal. I think education is a much different experience than it was when I was a kid, but I think that the music, and I was lucky, I had a good peer group and I got into the music my friends were listening to. But I still, still uh, am drawn to the Bach and the Beethoven and the, and the Mozart. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's my spiel about music. It's it's so fundamental, though. and I do think it keeps us together. We don't have music. We can't do music together. We're in really big trouble. Mm -hmm. So, but I had a friend. She was pregnant. Unfortunately, she was a drinker, a heavy drinker too, and she would. Her she was really big with the baby. She go up in front of a speaker and, you know, she listened to uh, heavy metal. And she said the baby was kicking inside. She was yes. totally gleeful. She was happy lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if the baby was, in, if the embryo was enjoying the, it that much. So, um, but I don't know that, but I've met that, that person 
when that person was born, became an adult, she was a charming, lovely person. Does she, she still have happy mouth? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what her musical tastes are. Um, that would be interesting to find out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't think she, I think she had a contentious relationship with her mother. Um, as an I, I, want, I, feel, I want to add in here. I mean, person. she functioned well as a person. The, the, the womb is not, uh, one of the things about it is not a, sonically, it's not a peaceful place. Right. Bloderdike mentions this. It's, it, it's very noisy. And uh, as a follow up to my story earlier, uh, after we had our child, uh, you know, you have to deal with the child crying and so forth, uh, how, how to pacify them. My daughter, she loved, uh, the only thing that would put her to sleep that would pacify her was uh, a band called Sigur Ross. And it was a music that uh, has many different uh, uh, qualities to it. But one of them is it can be very heavy and it can be very loud. Uh, and it was surprising that, you know, Mozart didn't do it for her, Bach didn't do it for her, but this very heavy, deep, um, uh, intense uh, type of music did. And then we also used a, a tape called The Happiest Baby on the Block. And what it, what it is, it's a recording of uh, the heartbeat of the mother inside of the womb. And it goes boom, 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 but with a lot of kind of feedback and background noise. It's not, a, um, it's soothing to the child because it's reminiscent of, of that experience in the womb. But it's, it, it doesn't at all resemble chamber music or, you know, anything, um, anything more rational. I'm curious about how, about how you get from that womb experience to the universe of types of music that we have. Right. You know, everything from metal, drone, jazz, classical, pop, etc. There is such a diversity of expressions of music and they resonate with people in different mm -hmm. states or in different mm -hmm. cultures, uh, different moods that we have. There's such a proliferation from that initial womb experience to the kinds of sonospheres we can uh, inhabit uh, as, you know, as we enter into culture. How does that, how does that connection remain? How does that still bring us back to that space of intimacy? How is it that I can listen to the band Anthrax or, um, you know, some, or John Cage or uh, Schoenberg or, or what have you and still feel, and it still works for me. That, that is very odd. Uh, because at some point we, I, I don't know what it is exactly. Um, I'm confused by it as well, but at some point we, we, we gravitate, you know, towards certain kinds of sounds that most resonate with us and we, that we feel at home with. And those could be very, uh, very, very non-harmonious, you could even say. And idi idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could mm -hmm. just be, you're mean, you know. No one in your family likes this, but you love it. So what? Um, but I think this is bringing up uh, a theme, I think, in this text, and I think it will probably hopefully get developed even more, is uh, when does the observer become a participant? And from reading this chapter and his look at the how the ear, he didn't say the embryo, but the ear could select, it can shut down certain sounds. Otherwise, you know, the the embryo would be a psychotic. So it, it's sort of like, like, like I imagine when you go to a, a loud cocktail party and there's music playing and you can hear this conversation for a few minutes, and then you can move over here and hear another conversation and uh, interact with another group of people. And you can um, select the sounds in the room that are relevant for your purpose. And I believe that's um, when the observer becomes a participant must happen very early. Um, I think we may be, um, you know, that embryo, I, I believe it, if it can move away from a needle and it can shut out certain sounds, um, it can hear the mother's voice. It can also hear the father's voice. And it can recognize also the mother, not just music, we're talking about language. The mother's speech affects the kinesthetic portion of the emerging embryo. So certain vowel sounds, when they're repeated, will have the same response in the embryos, uh, uh, emerging musculature. So a certain sound, will, the toe will, will move. Another sound, 
you know, a finger will move and it will be consistent. It will move every time that sound is made by the mother. So when it comes out, the baby's already primed to, to the mother's tongue, to the mother's speech. And um, these kinds of things are very mysterious. We, I don't think we know a whole lot about this. But, um, you know, our ability to speak all the languages that our species is able to do with the, you know, we basically have the same larynx, larynx and the tongue and the teeth. And uh, yet we have this multiplicity of sounds that can be produced, but we only, each language only uses a few of those sounds. So this is a, a very deep mystery. Um, another thing going back to the text I thought was interesting was he, I don't know the guy who he was quoting Mandel Branch or whatever, but he was talking about how this, uh, a, a, a man who had been born to a woman who had seen a terrible execution. And that trauma of seeing that execution produced this, uh, a baby that was uh, broken in the same way that the person she witnessed the execution. So I thought, I, th I don't buy that necessarily. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But I do think there are other experiences that I, I do believe that temporarily and maybe not so temporarily, we can be tuned into our, those primary caregivers. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of family mind. And even when they're dead and gone. Um, so I, it wouldn't surprise me at all that he mentions that uh, the, the, the embryo can tele, is in telepathic communication and can see what the mother sees. And... Um, and I think that happens, that capacity is highly developed in some people. The, the sensitive membrane, I think, that was mentioned earlier, um, some people are more sensitive than others to what, to what it's like to walk in another person's shoes. They can imagine very vividly and viscerally what it's like to be another person and to be in that person's situation. Other people are, can be very, you know, they, they can, they've shut down perhaps on that capacity for whatever reason. There may be very good reasons to shut down that, but there may be very good reasons for wanting to uh, open up, uh, you know, that that those sensitivities, and to find a, a balance. Because if we if we don't open up to them, they can be a great source of uh, of uh, anxiety. Because uh, you know the 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 defense that we that surrounds these kinds of episodes or these kind of experiences can be much worse than the, the stress of opening up to your, to your perhaps oversensitive. So we just have to find a way. I, I think as we become, I think we're all becoming more empathic whether we want to be or not. And um, I think this is a lot to do with our technology, but I think we're also becoming telepathic. Uh, and it's, it's not necessarily what it's cracked up to be because there's the boundaries are much more dynamic and fluid and there's a lot more disorientation that can happen um, unless you find ways of like that embryo tuning this out and picking up on that um, how we how we do that i think has a lot to do with aesthetics and what we find beautiful and what we find true and all what we find good and um but that's going to be very idiosyncratic from person to person some people are going to love stuff that I can't stand and vice versa. Somehow we have to figure out a way of being together in certain, you know, certainly in politics. These are my intuitions. Here. Yeah, I, I would love I to have, have a microphone, but, uh, but, uh, but only, you know, if and when you're ready. I, the only one thing I want to point, the only connection point I want to make, John, with what you said is um, page in the English version 480 where uh, Sullerick is beginning to talk about movedness or emotional movedness and, and tying that to the social, tying that to the political even. Uh, and the, uh, what he says is that those who become wise distance themselves from the Cretans, priests, politicians, and representatives. And it has to do with the ways in which socially we're moved by what we hear. Uh, and by this competition, he points to, to gain influence uh in the inner ear uh of, of the listeners uh and oftentimes it doesn't matter what the cognitive content is uh something feels right something sounds right uh and so we go with it 
that we are moved. Uh, we form groups, we form movements. Uh, and I think that that's very interesting, uh, particularly looking at, you know, social political phenomena. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. I, I have a feeling this will come back uh, and that uh, we'll, uh, we may revisit this at a kind of fractal scale uh, when we get to the, the social or the, the, the globes and the foam uh, levels of this. So cool. with that said. You hope you'll, he'll come back to that. <laughs> well, now he's not come back to anything. So yeah. somebody write this down. <laughs> so you can, yeah, write this down. We'll put it in a sealed envelope. We'll look at it later. Um, yeah, that, that that's whether he comes back to it or not. You know, to me, it, it still it still remains that I think it was with with um, with good reason to bring in Gapeser here. Sound is the medium of magical consciousness, period. The ear is the, is the magical organ. The, the intestines, the viscera, all, these are all words that have fallen now because that's, that's where we get moved. That's where we, feel, we, get, you know, we get that feeling in our gut when, when we resonate strongly with something, and, and that's a good thing. And that the, and that the, the fetus, the embryo, would start developing these capabilities of, let's say, learning to recognize what do I resonate with and what re do I resonate less with, because we have to learn to make distinctions. At some point, our own consciousness, our own individual development is going to move us in certain directions. Sometimes we don't like the music our parents liked because our parents like it. And there's no other reason than I wouldn't listen to what my parents listen to. In other situations, you love what your parents love. I have, I'm not a big band fan, but I have two daughters who traveled hundreds of miles to watch the revived Glenn Miller Orchestra put on a show because they really like that. Well, it just so happens they got along a lot more with my father than I ever did because that's what he listened to in the car when he was driving somewhere. So because they are on that same, let's say, sonoric wavelength, which is, which is perfectly okay. The thing is, my understanding of sound, and that's the other thing to bring in capes, or what is the characteristic of the magical consciousness? It's interwovenness, it's connection, it's bringing things together. You are not completely differentiated. That differentiation takes place over time and through many other other mechanisms that come into play, which I think is good because we do develop our own sense of who we, well, if we ever get around to it, developing our own <laughs> sense of who we are. Yeah. And, and, and what we like and what we don't like and being able to articulate that and produce sounds to others that, that helps them understand why we like these things and don't like other things. And so I, I see this, I see this as a very natural kind of thing. What I missed in this chapter, because this was the first chapter and excourses that I read where I went, yeah, so what? Because I didn't see that there was anything in there that was like new. He Maybe anticipated that. I don't know that I've missed it. And I'll be the first one to admit that. But just, to me, it, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and I'm not getting the and. That's why I don't think he's going to come back to it, because I don't think he got to it now where he had the chance. <laughs> I think this was, yeah, I think this was really <laughs> He did say that giving phenomenologically means giving nothing new in an entirely new way. So that may be part of what you're noticing there. <laughs> yeah, it may be. It may be. Exactly. I, I have to, what I'd like to say echoes Ed a bit, it piggybacks. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the amount of weight that Sloterdijk is giving to these womb experiences as over-determining um, later forms of human adulthood. And, and this goes to issues of emergence in, in the universe, that there's genuine emergence, a novelty that can't be explained by prior causal mechanisms or prior structures. This is just how the universe works. And most developmentalists, with lots of research, would say, people as varied as, varied as say, um, 
Susan Cook Reuter or someone like Kurt Fisher, his skill development theory, that um, these higher structures really do embrace these prior structures, at least in part, and recontextualize how they operate, rather than, which is what I think I'm hearing in Sloterdijk, the most initial experience in the womb and the separation and this formation of this five elemental sense of where the self is always relational. Um, everything seems to be something like a Freudian substitute that comes after it or some kind of a fit into a pre-existing slot as if something couldn't actually emerge that could encompass that and reshape the, the self stream and self directions and actions. And, it's just, a, it's a real concern and a question for me about how much explanatory weight he is giving to the, this kind of phenomenology of the, the no, object and of the, the womb experience. So that's first. Second is a little of an aside. Um, in listening to the Lacanian discussion, you know, which really became sort of seeing and hearing that opposition, that's a long opposition in German philosophy. Uh, this goes, usually dealing with art and media is one of the ways it arises, and that itself goes back to the Christian tradition, whether the ear or the eye was the primary spiritual um, organ. And then in the German tradition, which he's inheriting, uh, you know, some philosophers will pick visual media as primary, others auditory media as primary in their hierarchy of the arts. And I, I kind of heard an echo where he was sort of taking the hearing side of it over the, the image side. That, that was a contextualization for me. So those are the two things I, I throw in the, the space here. Can I, can I add something to that, Michael? I just wanted to respond because we had talked previously about um, whether or not a pre-trans fallacy had been committed by Schlotterdijk. And I, had, yeah. I was in doubt. I'm not in doubt anymore. I think he has committed that fallacy. When I hear this on page 26, Growing up consists in, in accepting that the magic enabling equation of call and success has the tendency to fade and ultimately disappear almost entirely. But how if, but how if those who seek no longer find, if what is called no longer comes? He's talking about the baby is hungry, calls for the mother, the mother feeds the baby. Um, that to me is like a real pre-trans fallacy he's committed. And he's just assuming that later on the adult learns that when you're hungry, you call for help or you want some assistance and you do not get it. That magical thinking fades away and disappears and you become realistic and you just uh, fit the bitterness and the unhappiness of the human race. And I just don't buy that. Well, I, I don't buy it either. But And I think uh, it's the pre-trans fallacy, a classic case. Yeah, not just my taste or or sensibility about what's possible for human existence, but you know, just science, just various philosophical ontologies about emergence. They're they're not about everything that comes later as a substitute. Mm -hmm. now, maybe in the one case, maybe in the case of the human animal, it's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, you know, but it's certainly not how much of the universe operates. Um, and not how development mentalists, I'll use Kurt Fisher's example, where prior skills, so hearing in the womb, we can take that in Kurt Fisher's sense as a skill. But that skill in development gets linked to other skills and eventually gets knitted into a higher structure, right? And it's these knittings of individual elements that come early on into higher and higher bundles that actually is how Kurt Fisher at Harvard models development. Well, if that's true, then why should uh, the, the sonics in the womb be the, the overarching structure for everything that comes after it, rather than not an element that gets restructured in something larger, more emergent? That's the, it's, I'm putting it as a question. That's the question I have, you know, let alone my own sensibilities about, you know, this is dark or not. Yeah. Now, I think it's an extremely valuable text. I, I think he's super, he's unbelievably rich in his erudition, his mobilization, his creativity with it. Um, 
the kinds of texts he's juxtaposing, the themes and the traditions he's bringing forward. I think it's super rich. It's just his underlying ontology and his sense of the human condition. I'm not sure where that is. That's mm -hmm. my, my sense of it. His ontology is still wobbling, eh, Michael? <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking not. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking his ontology of the human has something. I think he's, you know, defeating all the psychoanalysts, all the psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. what he's, he's taking some marginal people and mobilizing them. But I, you know, he's cut out, he's quote unquote, cut out Lacan here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like he's trying to create, it feels almost like a psychological theory of humanity that goes back into this initial, at least so far for me. I mean, I know mm -hmm. he's written a lot more and I've read some of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, the origins seem to be primary and over-determining. Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm getting. Okay. I don't know if it's right, but that's my sense. No, I, I, I find it's a very interesting, I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but I find that a very interesting... Uh... But George, just, but I think he's leaving out... I'm sorry, Ed, did I interrupt? Go you? ahead. No, no, go ahead. Right. No, no I, I, I tried to unmute myself, and by mistake I unmuted you. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm well, just sonic mystery. As we like to say, uh, Floyd Wilson. Um, <laughs> greetings from Sigmund here. <laughs> we kicked you out of the bubble there, Ed. <laughs> no, I actually wanted to say. Sonic, we kicked you out. Just riffing a, a little bit on what Michael said previously about emergence. And, you know, uh, I'm just thinking of uh, Oliver Sacks and the plasticity of the brain and how. Um, in deaf people, the auditory system is not functioning, mm -hmm. but the visual system takes over. So language, deaf people can use their bodies to sign, mm -hmm. and, they ha and, 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 the, and that's a visual language, and it has a syntax, um, and it's very rich and very complex. And I don't do sign. I had a boyfriend who was deaf, and I found myself able to figure out what was going on. You know, he was able to write things down. Mm. And uh, we had we had written the written word, but it was really interesting how expressive his body was. And even though I didn't do sign or anything, I could figure out what, what was going on in his head. He could externalize it in very creative ways. So I'm just putting that out, how plastic, you know, there's an intention. The nervous system is set up in a certain way to receive certain things from the environment so that this, uh, this interface between the self and the world can allow for emergence. But I think that he, I don't think Schlotterdijk is, is reading the same stuff I'm reading. <laughs> <having> the same, <laughs> uh, um, because I think we're, we're incredibly versatile. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though we may have severe traumas, um, except if the traumas are, are, I think within the first three months, I don't think those can be recovered from. But I think a lot of traumas and deprivations and the normal, you know, slings and arrows of daily life can, you know, we can find ways of managing it and moving forward with these agendas, which may not necessarily be our own. And they're, they're in, in pretty hardwired in us, I think, this need to transcend. So. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. Hold on. Jeffrey is muted. Let me un <laughs> I didn't mute you. I think you muted yourself. Okay. Your lips were moving. Yeah, to, to some extent, the, uh, uh, I mean, it may be true that Slaughter uh, is. But. Can't hear you. Can no. you break? Jeffrey, you're breaking up. Okay. Your signal okay. doesn't seem strong. Uh, I'll try again. Um, so, in some sense, I think Slaughter Dyke may have fallen into this fallacy, but um, I do think that he is pulling attention towards an area that has been neglected. Oh, uh, I agree. Or it is, and it is, it is being addressed now. It is starting to be addressed. I mean, there are a number of, uh, a, a fair amount of research going into trying to un untangle some of these things. Um, but it is still an area that has been neglected. And I, I do think 
uh, whether or not he 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 uh, he's fallen into this trap. Um, that his what he has to say about this is is important to listen to. Um, a, a couple of other things that came up in the discussion. One of the things Lutterdijk does not mention, and which is relevant to the sound experience of, of embryos, is that the frequencies are raised inside the placenta. The center. So the child, the, the embryo, does not hear sounds the way we do them. They hear the sounds in a higher frequency than we do, because the placenta modifies the frequency. So this idea that you listen to music in the embryo and then you listen to it again as an adult doesn't work, because the frequency that you hear the music is much higher than you would actually hear it in the regular environment. It's one of the reasons why many people naturally learn to speak in a high little voice to children just after they're born because they <laughs> respond to that high voice much more readily than they do to the lower voices because of the frequency shift inside the placenta so, uh, or inside that the environment. So some of the discussion about what you hear and what you hear later is is is, is modulated by that context. Uh, the other thing about the music is that music engages the entire brain as it's one of the few phenomena, sensory phenomena that we have that engages the entire brain. So the um, engagement and the creative engagement with music is less to do with the experience in the womb as it has to do with the structure of our brains that are designed to or that are have developed to engage the full brain in all of its different uh, variations and so it, at least part of what's going on has to do with that rather than the sonorous experience inside the womb i think mm. it's interesting. Mm. I'd like to say something about emergence because I think that part of what Sloterdijk is proposing here is a theory of emergence. And part of what he's also doing is establishing a priority or an ordering of, of emergent capacities. Uh, it's not, I think, just a matter of choosing between the image and the sound. I think he's saying and arguing on the basis of neonatal development that sound is prior uh, to image. And that perhaps later when we look at social phenomena or post or adult phenomena and perhaps even adult development, that's my interjection. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure he'll really ad address that directly, but that we may be often looking at image, verbal phenomena, mental phenomena, uh, and missing an underlying and more powerful and more effective uh, dimension of action, uh, which, uh, which if we understood emergence better, if we understood how sound and feeling influences thinking uh, and language, uh, we, might, uh, we might address differently. And I think that may be also why he goes back to the to the Berlin Love Parade and to the experience of immersion in uh, kind of participatory experiences that overwhelm us, that we can lose ourselves in. Because I mean, if, if just looking at political movements now, the Trump phenomena, et cetera, that they're often galvanized, mobilized by these large movements, these large assemblies that you lose yourself in, where there's a feeling tone, there's a sound tone. When I watched the debates with Trump and Hillary, for example, I had kind of gone in with the uh, journal, the, uh, you know, the media's biases around, you know, who, looking at what the better argument was, perhaps, or who, who was making, who was actually telling the truth. But I watched it with a friend of mine who was a Trump supporter and fan. And just being in his kind of world space there, I realized that Trump's sound, the way that Trump felt, felt was much stronger than the way that Hillary felt. The, 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 the notes that he was hitting uh, were, had a resonance that really 
was much more was more. This is, I think, why he won. Uh, he hit the notes that she couldn't hit uh, because she was trying to mentalize it. So I think it's significant, and um, I don't. I don't think it's reductive necessarily. I, I don't think he's trying to explain latter phenomena or latter developmental phenomena in terms of uh, earlier, uh, de- uh, you know, neonatal or womb, womb phenomena. But I think he's using this kind of analysis to establish a, um, a precedent, if you will, for what, how we might look at uh, later developmental phenomena. But I'm open to your arguments about the reduction. I'm not just trying to defend him. I, I actually think that it is a theory of emergence. In, in, and it's sort of looking at the, a microcosm or a, a genetic moment uh, to kind of set the, you know, set the schema, you know, f- for later uh, emergences. Uh, the, the question I, well, first, you know, there are in these emergences theories, notions of upward causation. So something prior can actually impact forward. So that's just one theoretical model. Um, the question I have is how, are, how is the prior impacting later emergence? Like what are the stakes in it? Is it an element that's knitted in? So there's a high frequency, uh, presumably there's a high frequency experience of sound in the womb presumably not affecting the whole brain because the brain hasn't even developed yet. And then in adulthood or at some point, music, a human artifact with a certain structure to it, activates the entire brain. Now that seems more expansive than the sound in the womb, even though the sound in the womb is probably a precondition or could be a precondition for, for at least music in some sense. So, that's different for me from saying something like, I don't think I'm not going to be saying it. Music is a substitute for some loss that can never be recovered. Mm. And I hear that a lot. Now it's interesting. Maybe that's true, but then later developments become, I don't know how, if, if this is what he means by the notion of immunological, but it, these become protective devices of a sense of unsafety in the loss, these early losses, and that culture forms that kind of a function. I don't know if that's how far he goes, but I have some sense he might be operating that way. So the question is, what is that emergent servant, is what mm-hmm. I think. You know, uh, this is sort of very personal, but I took care of a, an old lady. She died a, about six months ago. She was 94. She had Alzheimer's, very severe dementia, and she was deaf in one ear and um, she had aphasia. She couldn't communicate well at all to anyone except she and I had very good rapport. And I was the only person she remembered. She didn't remember family, but she remembered me because I think we had this connection. But I, I found she, she was a, I took her dancing twice a week. I took her to Fred Astaire studio and she could do all that ballroom stuff, that foxtrot and the waltz and all that. And she would get dressed up and she looked fantastic. So there's something about music, especially the music of our youth, that can, I believe, um, regress us to a kind of vitality. In, in her case, it certainly did. But right towards the end, um, I put on some Tibetan chant. I didn't know what to do. I had a computer there. She was dying. We were in a nursing home. Her family wasn't there. It was just me and her. And uh, we had already said our goodbyes. We had already honored one another. And I just didn't know what to do, but I was... I just, these Tibetan chants, as soon as I put it on, she went, oh, she was amazed. And, you know, I could tell she was seeing things in the room. You know, she was like reaching out. And um, she died, the, they said maybe two or three days. They don't know. I, you know. I told her family, you know, I don't know when it's going to happen. But she went just like that. Hmm. And it was pain-free. She was not on any drugs. She had no morphine, no drugs. In her. But to me, it was just there's something. I think Tibetan, Tibetan um, music, those overtones, it's very primary, very primal kind of sounds. Anyway, I'm just sharing that because, you know, there's that old thing about sound, sound mind, sound body. 
and I believe that um, you know our experiences in the wombs are so I, I think our subtle bodies coordinate sounds and rhythms and tempos, and then I think believe out of all of that emerges capacity for language and cognition. But like you were saying earlier about how um you know we we build upon these uh, previous stages and they become elaborate. Uh, as we are exposed to novel situations that have to be addressed. Many of us, no one has ever done this before. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do this. And I've never done it before. I think many of us, many more of us are being confronted with things like that. So uh, we're going to have to, I think, find ways of uh, embracing this novelty, these capacities for the, the new. Anyway, that's my two cents. But it was a, magne it was a magical moment. A magical moment. I will never, she's with me forever. Sound magic. Something I just want to feed off of what John just said. Um, I, had a, I had a fellow student of mine in graduate school, and she was working at an assisted living place. And a lot of her patients, a lot of her, her people that she was caring for were non-communicative. You know, they couldn't speak, maybe couldn't hear. They just, for one reason or another. And, uh, this this woman, this colleague of mine, she was very happy, very positive, very musical herself. And she was just singing to herself one day as she was going about her chores, cleaning the rooms and giving out medicine and stuff like that. And she just happened to you know, see this woman. She said, how are you doing today? And the woman said, I'm great. How are you today? And it, she stopped in her tracks because she had never heard this woman speak before. And it was one of those things that it was either her singing, which made that breakthrough that she understood what my friend was saying, or finally somebody spoke to her in a language that she could speak back. She couldn't speak in her normal voice, how are you doing today? But if she could sing, how are you doing today? And once that revelation was made, my friend was like every day that now she was singing to this woman just to be able to communicate with her and have that spark. So you know, kind of like what John was saying, there are these other ways of communicating and they're primal and they've probably been with us since the womb. And we need to remember that sometimes when we maybe can't communicate on any other level, try music, try singing, try Tibetan, tunes, you know, making noise with a flute or a drum or your, you know, just your larynx itself just to see if you can break through and make that connection with somebody and actually resonate with them. So the same thing, John. I mean, that, I will never forget that story. That was part of her, her, her final master's thesis was kind of working with this woman then. So it was really cool. I use Broadway songs, especially for people <laughs> in their 90s, because they, they were Broadway babies. They, you know, they listened to all that stuff. So you'll be swell. You'll be great. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I was a song and a dance man around her. And I danced and I sang. Yeah. She had a big, she beamed. You know, she's yeah. a big comedian. Is that all we want? Is that all we want in life? A song and a dance? Is that what it all? <laughs> well, you got it this time, guys. <laughs> Singing, so much, it's got no rhythm. Cognitive. All right. Well, we're we're just about at the end of our time. So, uh, if anyone else wants to add something, or... I, I was going to say, singing engages a different uh, part of the brain than speaking. Mm -hmm. Do we need a, uh, a grand finale here? Do we need to, to fade out? How do we end the song? <laughs> well, I, I, well, I was thinking we could all write each of us a for and against article about Slaughter Dick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can be both for him and against him at the same time, actually. Me too, yeah. <laughs> can you submit what our favorite song is or something like that? Wouldn't that be easier? <laughs> <laughs> He's very destabilizing in a good way because they, he makes me have to rethink a lot of things and argue better. Than I <laughs> we have one more call two weeks from now. And uh, would anyone like to be the, uh, to kick it off next time? Oh, good Lord. What is the topic du jour? <laughs> the <laughs> end. He <laughs> crawls <laughs> back into the moment we start all over. Yeah, maybe, maybe not the bitter end, but it's the end. <laughs> I've got to go, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Oh, bye. Thanks. Thanks.
closer to me than I am myself, a theolog theological preparation for the theory of the shared inside. Wow. Wendy, it's I bow to you. I think this is just right for me. Oh, yeah, I figure I'm due. All right. <laughs> we, figure, we figure you are too. <laughs> oh, thanks. All right. I'll do my best. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'll be back in Colorado next week. And I hope to catch up on the forum because I feel like I've, uh, I feel like you've, you've been uh, digging in uh, mm -hmm. some substantial back and discussions there. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm missing the music. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, We'll Some talk. of us are still whistling the same tune, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that tune. My mother used to sing that tune. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you. you all. all right. Okay. Bye. 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 Till next time. Till next time. Yeah. Right on.